Hi everybody, welcome to the first Offshore Renewable Special Interest Group webinar of 2021. Um, and we are delighted to welcome Stuart Hilburn, who is a specialist in instrumentation and data analysis for offshore structures at Fugro. And he is here to talk about work undertaken for the Carbon Trust Floating Offshore Wind Technology Acceleration Competition on condition monitoring system for floating offshore wind turbine mooring lines. So without further ado, over to Stuart. Well, thank you for the introduction, Alice. Um, I'll just share my screen. I've got a presentation to, to work through. Hopefully this will come up. Okay, I'm just waiting for it there. You should be able to see that now. Um, so my name is Stuart Kilburn. I, I work for Fugro. Um, and I'm going to present today some fatigue monitoring um, of floating offshore wind turbines uh, aimed at the mooring lines uh, that we've done. Uh, this is a, a project that was funded by the Scottish Government and uh, organised through the Carbon Trust with their floating offshore wind GIP partners. You can see all the operators there that are involved in this. Um, so quite a range, um, both uh, in the UK and around the world. So it's a, a great opportunity that we've had. Um, to give the, the sort of overview of the, the project, you know, the, the mooring lines and their fatigue and, and being able to get the condition of them is, is sort of one of the key um, areas of concern when we, when we go to floating wind. Um, so what we are proposing to do is to take motion and position measurements of these floating hulls and interpret them with finite element simulations and use that measured data and the model to infer the mooring line tensions. And from that, the tension data, you know, we're able to predict uh, and track the fatigue over the life of the, the unit. Um, I mean, you can calculate fatigue using stand, industry standard SN curves. Uh, but in addition to that, we've, we've partnered with the University of Strathclyde um, to do a peridynamic fatigue analysis. Uh, and that sort of captures um, crack initiation and how that progresses towards a fracture. Um, and the, sort of one of the aims of this project was to sort of model uh, the sort of floating uh, turbines used on the High Wind Scotland site, so that's Equinor's project, um, because they have published uh, some data from their monitoring system that's that's installed on th those units. Uh, so we have some data from the field to work with. The objectives of the project are to reduce or eliminate the subsidy inspection um, of the mooring lines, and that is one of the sort of key critical cost saving objectives. You are aiming to do it using remote monitoring and utilize reliable and robust um, instrumentation that's within the, the floating hull and sort of a protected environment. And because we're making these measurements essentially on a continuous basis, 24 seven, we're able to look at that data and do anomaly detection on it and be able to identify in a timely manner uh, some of the sort of concerns or failure scenarios, things like anchor drag um, and, and other things that might go wrong that we would certainly want to know about. So that's the overall uh, picture of, of the project, what we're trying to achieve. Um, we, you know, to, to do this project, we formed a consortium of both Fugro, uh, who would do the sort of monitoring and sort of data processing aspect. We've got AS Mosley, who are do a lot of offshore simulation and, and the sort of how the floating unit behaves in different sea states. And we've got the University of Strathclyde involved doing their peridynamic fatigue analysis. Uh, so the, the work was organized roughly split into four work packages. Uh, one was about the simulation and calculation of fatigue. Uh, work package two was about anomaly detection. Uh, work package three was the peridynamic analysis. And then of course there was a, a final report um, you know, which we have now reached the stage of having submitted that final report um, just yesterday. So we've got some contents there um, that we'll look through this simulation, how we verified 
the method, how we've tried to validate it against High Wind Scotland data, how the anomaly detection works based on the sort of simulations of these sort of failure scenarios, um, and then the sort of outcomes of the peridynamic analysis. So jumping right into the, the simulation. Um, so I've got a video of the, the sort of time evolution of the, the floating winds. You can see that it's got, a, you know, the rotor blades are rotating, you know, at the sea state, um, you know, the waves are undulating on the, the water surface and, and the floating unit and the mooring lines are responding to these inputs. So that model was based on the, the High Wind Scotland published data set. So information about the, 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 the floating unit and uh, the data that's uh, recorded on it. There's various online uh, resources about bits of the turbine and there's a publicly available five megawatt turbine model. Of course, uh, High Wind Scotland, they use six megawatt turbines, are slightly larger. And so to, to sort of scale that up, we've done some sort of generic substitution. But you know, we've with the information available, which is, is not complete, uh, you know, we've, we've got the best model that we, we feel we can produce, and it's a full hydrodynamic, aerodynamic, and structural response model. Now, the way that uh, we use this model together with the, the measured data, um, in the first instance, when we look at the simulations, we're able to put virtual sensor packages onto that simulation model and pull out the position of it, pull out accelerometer signals that would be measured and pull out gyroscope measurements. Um, the other thing that's critical, of course, is what is the tension in the mooring lines that we want to monitor? And when we take that information, we're able to generate transfer functions that relate the, the measured signals to that mooring line tension. And so when we actually have that data, we can feed it into this black box that takes the motion and position signals and converts it to mooring line tension. And so we've done that you know, software that will do that calculation. So we've got calculated tension and we've also got the simulation tension you know, directly from the simulation. And you can see we've got on the right here, we've got some comparisons of the time series data. And you can see that the, you know, the simulation uh, in blue and, and the calculated version in green, you know, they, they overlap very nicely and capture all the cycles. So, um, you know, so these are for two different sea states, so two different sort of motions, but using, but, but the same sea state, same wave height and same direction of waves, uh, just to sort of demonstrate that these transfer functions actually do reproduce the, the sort of motions and tensions in the mooring lines. And, and below the time series plot, of course, there's the, the sort of power spectral density of the two. And you can see that uh, various features at different frequencies are all replicated um, in the sort of calculated tensions. So this is uh, how we go about um, calculating the tensions in the mooring lines with the sort of remote monitoring system. So ultimately, the measured accelerations and gyroscopes would come from wheel sensors on the, on the, the floating hull. Now, when we look at fatigue, you know, we've got um, courtesy of, of High Wind Scotland, of, of Equinor and ORE Catapult, we've got 11 published data sets for 11 different sea states. And what we've done is we've taken those sea states and created three hour simulations for each, and then divided that into 10 minute segments where we calculate the fatigue every 10 minutes. Um, and that just gives us a, a short enough time scale that the sea state isn't wouldn't change in reality wouldn't change very much uh, but long enough to sort of give a, a reasonable duration and so we've able to take all these different sea states and from all the 11 different sort of simulation cases we've taken the virtual sensor signals fed it through the transfer functions reproduced the mooring line stress cycles and you know as, as a sort of industry standard method um, to sort of do the sort of verification here, we have applied a, an SN curve, you know, just with stress um, to the power three uh, as the sort of indicator for fatigue. And you can see my graph here, you know, on the x-axis, I've got the simulation fatigue. So that's taking the, the tension time series straight out of the simulation. Um, 
and compared it against the calculated fatigue um, by taking the sort of virtual sensor packages and processing them. And the, the cervical sort of fatigue ratio or uh, agreement uh, is something like 0.9. So we're able to capture a lot um, of the, the, the motion and response in the mooring lines just by measuring these sort of virtual sensor packages on the floating unit. So that's 0.9, that's a 10% error in fatigue. And of course, uh, you know, with stress to the power of three, that's, that's a 4% a error in the sort of stress cycle ranges that are, are found. And that, that really is pretty good um, in terms of fatigue. Um, now, obviously, there are lots of different wave and wind conditions. You know, the wind comes from all kinds of different directions. Uh, and the structure itself is not cement, you know, it's not, um, uh, the response differs as you look at different directions because of the layout of the anchors and the mooring system. So we investigated simulations um, where the wind and wave came from different directions. Of course, that's, there's three mooring lines on High Wind Scotland. So we've got a kind of 120 degree arc and, and everything else would be a kind of symmetrical outcome from that. So looking at that sort of range of different incoming weather, uh, we tried matching using the sort of transfer function for 140 degree direction and, and having the actual um, measurements um, from all these sort of different directions just to see how close you have to be in terms of wind and wave direction. And the outcome was that so long as the wind and wave is correct to about 10 degree and within a 10 degree bin, so plus or minus five degrees, then that's pretty acceptable. And you can see there that for across the sort of range of angles, that the correlation that you get in the sort of tension cycles is, is high. And that sort of fatigue matching ratio, you know, how close to one can you get? And, you know, if it, one is the sort of ideal perfect uh, outcome. Um, then, then what we found is we need to do 36 simulations to capture all these different transfer functions uh, for all the sort of different wind and wave directions. Uh, in a similar state, um, we have looked at different wave heights and how the response differs when you've got very calm weather, so maybe a one meter significant wave height. Uh, and then all the way up to 12 metres, which, which is not uncommon in the North Sea uh, off the coast of Scotland. Um, and sort of look at how, how accurate using transfer functions that were from a different uh, wave height would be. So we picked six metres, is in the middle, and we put in the, the sort of virtual sensor packages from simulations from one metre all the way up to 12. And you can see there that uh, as long as the wave height is within... Uh, sort of two or three meters, um, you know, we get very good uh, agreement in that sort of fatigue ratio matching. Um, so that leads us to creating this sort of database of transfer functions at 10 degree direction bins and for something like three meter wave height bins. Obviously, you could do better than that, you can make it finer resolution than that, but, but uh, you know, you don't get a huge benefit in the accuracy of the fatigue calculations. So in practice, uh, one of the things that we need to get from the monitoring system is what is the wave height uh, and what's the wave direction? Of course, these things are, um, you can either measure them directly with sort of suitable instrumentation for wave heights and wave radars and such things, or we can use a sort of proxy for that. We could use the heave motion um, of the, the floating hull you know, which is something that we would measure anyway. Um, obviously, the the nacelle yaw, you know, the, where the you know the propeller veins into the wind to, to sort of you know to rotate. Um, you know that that's also output by the sort of control systems. So that's another way of getting the wind direction. So. Uh, as I say, we, we've got these published data sets from High Wind Scotland, from their monitoring system. And that uses the sort of, uh, there is a GPS system, there is a, an inertial navigation unit 
installed and some of the data from them have been made available. And that's what we were hoping to use in this project to do the sort of validation. You know, we've, we've verified it against the sort of software works correctly using simulation data, but let's go to the real world and a real floating thing and see if it works. And so we're able to compare the, the mooring line tensions that we calculate from horizontal position and from pitch uh, motion of the Highwind Scotland floater. Um, feed that into transfer functions and get the tension in the mooring lines. And we're able to compare that against uh, subsea load cells that are installed on Highwind Scotland at the connection point where, where there are six bridles, in fact, come up and, and sort of connect onto the hull uh, below the water, about 20 metres below the water. And so some of the results are here. This, this is a sort of an example of what can be achieved. We've got the cycle ranges arranged in rank order, so the largest cycle next to the y-axis, and then the smaller cycles uh, as you move along the x-axis and, and, you know, in total, in a 10 minute period, you know, we had about a thousand cycles, some of them very small. And then we've got the, the sort of power spectra for that. Uh, so the cycle ranges are important here you know, again, because the fatigue is the stress cycle range to the power three. You know, if you look at the spectra, you can see this at hydrodynamic modes, you know, at, at sort of tens of seconds, uh, between about 20 second period down to about a hundred second period. Um, so they are there at the low frequency. You can see this sort of wave excitation around 10 seconds. Um, you can sort of look at the load cell signal and you can sketch in roughly where the sort of noise floor is for that sensor. Um, and uh, you know, our conclusion, when you look at results like this, you would say that was quite promising that we're able to replicate that. You know, here's, here's an example of what can be done. You know, we've got a, a time series of tension in one of the, the bridles. Uh, we've got the load cell and we've got the calculated tension from the, the motions. That, you know, and this is for a real floating system. So we've got a large, low frequency, approximately 100 second period hydrodynamic mode. So probably some sort of interaction of the current, in fact, um, with the, the floater. Uh, to give that sort of motion and superimposed on that, you've got uh, a kind of wave uh, response, a, a 10 second uh, period. Uh, and you know, you can see the signals do visually look very similar. However, uh, what we found is that when we looked at all the, the sort of published data and all the different C states and we processed them, uh, this was the correspondence uh, in terms of calculated fatigue against load cell fatigue. Now, you remember the last one uh, that looked very similar to this. Um, for the simulation data, we had all the data points clustered on that 45 degree line, you know, showing, you know, a kind of ideal correspondence between the, the load cell fatigue and, and the sort of calculated fatigue. Uh, here, we don't have that. Um, we, we've got a, bit, a much more messy picture. Um, now, some of the explanation for this is that one of the load cells was rather f noisy, that the signal from it was not clean um, and was noticeably worse than, than the other five that were installed. And that accounts for high levels of fatigue in the load cell signal that isn't found in the calculated fatigue. And that's all the green dots, the Bridal 5 load cell uh, was, was the one that was noisy. And you know, we've got this other problem of lots of uh, fatigue me measurements that are calculated um, that over predict the fatigue um, when the load cell doesn't give that higher high a, a fatigue estimate. And the most likely causes of this uh, are things like problems in the data set, spurious data, um, which we'll come on to. And because of the limitation of the published data, they did not publish um, the sort of raw accelerometer signals from the monitoring unit sensor package on the floater. We only got the angles. So the, the pitch, the roll, and the yaw um, 
as time series out of that. And ideally, you know, we've identified that actually having that accelerometer signal on the uh, from the floater hull is is really the the thing that you you want. Um, so just to sort of touch again on on the sort of data quality, um, you know, our conclusion was that you know we had some promising results. You know, we're able to replicate some good data, some instances where we can use the motions and position of the floater to calculate the mirroring line tension. But in other cases, uh, the results are a bit harder um, to accept. Uh, so it's not a conclusive demonstration or validation. Um, when we looked at the sort of position data from the GPS system installed on the floater, uh, here's an example of the, the northing against time. Uh, uh, this is the worst case of spurious transitions. And you can see here that the, the y-axis is meters. And so this, this is showing, this, this says that the floating hull moved about six or six and a half meters in, in the space of one second. Now, obviously that, that is implausible in reality, but this is the measured signal from, from the data that's available. Um, what really is happening here, as I understand, is um, you get these kind of transitions in GPS position when the constellation of satellites that's used to fix the position, when one of them drops out, you know, falls below the horizon or, or appears above the horizon, um, then any sort of bias associated with that satellite suddenly gets removed or, or added back in. Um, it's further compounded because the floating unit is, is bobbing on the water. So we've got a lot of heave mo motion going on. And so you get these satellites that are really marginal near the horizon and they're coming in and out of the constellation using the fix. It's doing that at the same time as the wave kind of period or, or the sort of heave motion of the floater. Um, so this really is quite a messy signal to put into the sort of transfer functions. And, and the, the inevitable consequence of this is that the fatigue and tension cycles that, that come out of the analysis are phenomenally high, much higher than they should be. This is a, this is a poor example uh, of GPS data. And you're know, looking through all the 11 data sets that were available. Uh, we pretty much had to get rid of half of them um, on account of this, the, there were huge uh, spurious transitions. The others probably still had smaller transitions um, present in them, uh, but you know we, we've tried to use it, but that may explain some of the sort of high, fa high fatigue numbers that come out. Uh, the other lack in the, the High Wind Scotland data sets that's published is there is no vertical position, so there's no um, altitude from the GPS signal. Obviously, heave motion of the floater uh, is actually a key driver of tension. So th this is quite a blind spot um, in that the data that's available to do the validation. Um, you know, the, the angle that the mooring lines come onto the floater is actually slightly closer to vertical than it is to horizontal. So only having horizontal position um, you know, is, is a bit of a a, a, a lack, you, you, a, a problem. Um, as I mentioned, we don't have the sort of accelerometer data. We you know, we only have sort of processed orientations. You know the 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 pitch, roll, and yaw. But you know if you go back to high school um, and physics class, and and you'd have learned about Newton's second law, um, force is equal to mass times acceleration. Of course, force here is the tension in the mooring line. And so having the accelerometer signal is, is the sort of best and key uh, signal to sort of use in that sort of equation um, to get to the mooring line tensions. Uh, and, and obviously uh, another problem is there is noise on the load cell signals and one of them was particularly bad. Um, so we weren't able to do the a conclusive validation uh, based on high wind data that was available to us. But we did come to some useful uh, roadmap to the sort of monitoring system that you would need 
uh, in order to to do remote monitoring and and do what we've planned to do. Uh, one of the findings is that we need to use high accuracy or what they call differential GPS, um, and that minimizes the noise and minimizes the bias from any one of the satellites by taking into account delays from the ionosphere um, or aberrations in the satellite orbits. So these sort of corrections can be made. Um, and the other finding is that we definitely need uh, you know, a, a triaxial accelerometer signal and, and also preferably triaxial gyroscope. Um, sensor package installed on these and to have access to these uh, raw sensor signals, particularly the accelerometers. Uh, to move on to some of the, the other sort of topics of the, the project, uh, anomaly detection. Um, so we were able to simulate in that simulation, that OrcaFlex model, uh, various failure scenarios or events, you know, things like trawler snags, you know, fishing boats. Um, dragging of an anchor that might occur in rough weather, you know, actual failure of one of the sort of redundant bridles um, that's part of the mooring system, or, or loss of the floater ballast or some sort of change. Um, so our approach to that was to sort of, again, segment the, the recorded data, that time series data, into 10 minutes, calculate statistics uh, for each 10-minute segment, and use that as a sort of statistical threshold um, to to look for significant changes, and you know, by having simulations of the intact structure and simulations of the the event or the sort of failure, um, be able to show that you know we can see a significant change. So, just to look at a couple of the case studies, uh, let's look at the trawler snag. You know, here is a graph of the time series of the position of the floater, and halfway through this. Um, after about 15 minutes, uh, I, you know, we simulate a trawler, um, you know, with fishing nets deployed over the back, uh, snagging on one of the mooring lines, um, and you know, the the ISO standard does you know have a description of what these sort of loads look like and and how we should design for them, and uh, and when we look at that, uh, we notice that there is a large step change in the position of the floater over a time scale of about 100 seconds, um, which is the period of the, the sort of surge and sway modes of the, the floater on its mooring line. So I uh, wouldn't really expect to see anything faster than that. So what we did was, you know, to look for that sort of step change over that sort of relatively short time scale, um, sort of averaging the position 100 seconds before and, and comparing it 100 seconds after some theoretical event uh, and sort of getting that step change amplitude. And we were able to, to set a, a threshold of about an eight meters um, for this sort of detection. So we took lots of intact and sort of various failure scenarios, uh, the simulation data from that. And so I've highlighted um, the, the cases um, which, which we arbitrarily put in, you know, labeled with a date stamp of September. Uh, that were the trawler snag simulations. And you can see here the excursion that uh, has occurred, you know, exceeds that eight meter threshold. Uh, and we've been able to identify and, and sort of mark these ones as being anomaly. The other points that you see um, along the x-axis, these dots, uh, in May and June, that's the intact structure in different directions uh, in May and different wave heights in June. So that the worst dots for June are 12 meter storm conditions. So even a 12 meter storm, we're not seeing the, the floater typically change um, by as much as eight meters. Um, so that, that's, that's a key one. Uh, and the other ones in sort of August through to the end of December, these are other, the other sort of failure scenarios with anchor drag uh, and uh, loss of ballast and, and other ones. But it's the, the trawler snag really is the one that produces this large, excursion, so very readily identifiable um, from the data. Um, one of the other key ones, I think, for anomaly detection is something like anchor drag, where the, the anchor is pulled radially inwards towards the sort of center position um, of where the float is. So you know, again, that might happen in really high waves. So we looked at the, the simulations of the intact structure, and we've got lots of different directions. 
So we've got two meter waves, but lots of different directions over that's 120 degree arc. Um, and generally what happens is that even in relatively light wind or, or light waves, the, the, the floater is pushed of the order eight to 10 meters away from the center position. Obviously you can see the sort of results um, uh, for two of the directions for the waves going from one meter all the way up to 12. So it, it's got that kind of different sort of distribution there and, and the one at the top of the, pay, the, top of the graph there. Um, so we, what we want to do here is our, our, our method said, well, let's take the simulation results and correct for the predicted position. And let's average over that 10 minute duration. And we're able to pull in all these points that are eight to 10 meters away from the central position and do the correction and bring them in quite nicely to the center position and set really quite a tight watch circle um, for what is the sort of corrected position of the floater um, to something like one meter. Uh, and that's really saying that, uh, you know, if you've got anchor drag, you get movement of that anchor by more than about a meter, it's going to, you know, that, that sort of corresponds to moving the floater about a meter. Um, and certainly some, you know, when it's, when the dragged anchor is, is up wind or up wave, um, you know, the, the floater position is going to get pushed further than you would expect. Um, so the, the sort of sensitivity is the sort of radius of that watch circle. So it's about a meter. Um, obviously, you know, we've got very limited, this is a simulation data. We've got very limited field data to sort of do anything and that there's a lot of problems with that data. We would need to review larger quantities of real data to set this sort of watch circle and to sort of see how well it would perform in reality. But based on the simulation data, uh, this is really very good and very uh, sensitive to drag of that anchor. Obviously, this is a 10 minute average and we can do uh, you know, we can do better than that. We can average over longer periods of time and we can categorize the data for different sort of sea states or different incoming directions to sort of, um, you know, get that cluster of points even tighter if we need to. Uh, other ways that we can exploit, you know, anomaly detection is, is not just to look at a single um, floating turbine, but to, you know, we're going to have instrumentation uh, we envisage on all of them, you know, which, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, could be 50 or 100 units, you know, in the near future, I think it's probably going to be limited to three, four or five, um, as people do their sort of uh, pre-commercial checks, you know, Highwind Scotland is five uh, individual floating units. You know, we're able to do lots of things to compare the response of uh, all these sort of different units, um, lots of data analytics are all possible and we can do sort of, sort of cohort analysis and find the one that's not behaving the same as all the, all its neighbours. Um, and that's another way of picking out things that, you know, are potentially problems or things that, you know, need to be investigated. Uh, moving on to the, the sort of third work package in the project is the peridynamic fatigue modelling. Uh, peridynamics might be unknown to you. It might, it might be it's a very relatively new uh, discipline, uh, but it really is the study of fatigue and cracks. Um, some of the features of it is that it doesn't use differential equations, but it uses sort of integral equations. So it, it's ideal for cracks because cracks are discontinuity. So doing it with the integral approach avoids that problem. Um, the, you know, there's no need for a, a kind of externally supplied crack growth law and you can have multiple cracks that evolve in complicated patterns that, that you don't need to know about in advance. And so some of the examples of where it's been used, um, you know, for a different sort of engineering analysis or impacts are sort of shown there. Um, just some history lesson on fatigue methods. Uh, you know, so the SN curve, which we, you know, which, which we have used, um, you know, come dates from sort of 1870, but it only tells you, you know, how 
fatigue in a sort of pristine, brand new piece of steel or, or metal uh, degenerates to the point where these sort of fatigue cracks begin to grow and, and be joined together. Um, and, and at that point, uh, you know, it kind of stops having application. It doesn't really see how the fracture then progresses. Um, how cracks indeed propagate is, is sort of described by Paris law, which dates from 1963. Um, and it captures that sort of middle section of the sort of cracks uh, sort of beginning to propagate uh, due to fatigue. But uh, peridynamic analysis is, is very recent, you know, 2014. Um, and it sort of captures uh, the sort of degradation due to fatigue damage across all these sort of regimes and it's able to predict, predict uh, the time, you know, to sort of failure to the appearance of cracks and how these cracks propagate. Um, you know, it's applied by using a mesh across the sort of the component that's, that's under stress and looking at different sort of uh, sites or different sort of uh, parts of that structure um, and how they are sort of linked together. And as you sort of deform that structure and stretch it, the sort of bonds between these sort of discrete parts um, snap and you can get a broken interaction. And sort of over time and over stress cycles, you know, the, these sort of links between the sort of, uh, sort of partitioning of the, the sample sort of break down. Um, so here's, here's a, a kind of verification. So the software that was developed for our uh, analysis here was verified against uh, tests done on a mechanical specimen. Um, so it's a kind of squarish plate with a couple of holes to, to put some, some load links uh, so that you're pulling on that. And there's already a crack initiated uh, in the specimen. And so over time, as you apply different load cycles, that crack gets longer. You can see that it, uh, as you get from 2000 cycles uh, through different uh, amounts up to the sort of 40,000 cycles, that crack has, has sort of grown almost twice in, in length. And so we've got the, the sort of uh, plot of how many load cycles um, and how that crack length grows. And that this is a sort of showing that the peridynamic prediction matches what was measured in the experiment. So we take that and we apply it to a component of the mooring line in the High Wind Scotland site. So it, one of the components is what we call a triplate. So there's a picture of it there. And there is a mooring line that goes down, uh, to, uh, down to the seabed, down to an anchor that's uh, about 600 metres um, from the, the floater. And the triplate, that single mooring line is split into two, two bridles that are then sort of go up and connect onto the floater hull. Uh, so a total of three mooring lines, um, each one giving two bridles, six bridles, um, and uh, there's, there's three triplates sort of making this connection. So this is a, obviously a key component in the mooring system. Uh, and uh, you know, the simulation models were, were predicting the, the stress, uh, or sorry, tension cycles, uh, just that the sort of connections into this triplate so we take this local model in this sort of peridynamic analysis of that triplate and we apply the mooring line tension cycles. Um, so we, we picked a constant um, load. Um, for this example that we're presenting, that there's variable loading as well. Uh, but taking that constant load and applying 10,000 cycles, there's essentially no apparent degradation. But as you go to slightly higher, um, you begin to see the initiation of fatigue around that upper hole where the mooring line connects into the triplate. That's this a single mooring line. And as you go to 20,000 cycles, you can see just below it, the, the sort of degradation uh, and damage beginning to occur um, below that hole. And as you go to 30 and 40 and then 50,000 cycles, uh, the damage around that hole begins to propagate uh, and you know at that point we begin to see cracks forming and uh, 
sort of degradation of the triplate, it would um, begin begin to be something that you know you could inspect and see a physical degradation of. So that's um, sort of output of the sort of peridynamic. We've got not just how long it takes to to expend the fatigue life, and you know in that actual you, know, you can do this sort of the SN curve calculation, and, and you get that uh, sort of. Uh, 10,000, just over 10,000 cycles. Um, you know, when we begin to see the fatigue damage appear in the peridynamic model. Uh, but you obviously, as we go to higher and higher numbers of cycles, we see that sort of crack propagation until it eventually fails or at just over 50,000 cycles. Um, so, sort of overall conclusions from our, our project was uh, the sort of monitoring system specification on a floating uh, wind turbine. We should definitely be looking at triaxial accelerometer measurements, triaxial gyroscope measurements. Uh, we would need a, a high accuracy or differential GPS receiver antenna that gives horizontal position and altitude. Uh, we aim to collect all that data at a minimum of five hertz. In, in our simulations, we assume 10. Um, and you know, we believe that sort of sample rate would capture all the dynamic loads, all the sort of wave response, all the hydrodynamic response, and there wouldn't really be anything higher than that. Uh, all the data would need to be synchronized. Um, but critically, you know, the one thing that we're not including is any sort of subsea load cell or any subsea instrumentation at all. Um, simply because that is difficult and expensive to install and difficult and expensive to maintain. And it's certainly, in, in my view <laughs> or my experience, it would be very unlikely to last 20 years. Um, whereas the, the sort of accelerometer and GPS that signals, um, you know, that instrumentation, you know, would certainly be good for, you know, 20 years, the sort of design life of a, a floating turbine and certainly it's easy to maintain should it need to be replaced or repaired. Um, just to sort of try and give a complete overview of how this sort of data processing is working. Um, what we have is up front, we were able to do that simulation. Um, so that work uh, was done by A.S. Mosley, um, one of our uh, consortium partners. And from that simulation, we were able to build up this transfer function database. And then we take the mooring system, so the measurements of accelerations, gyroscopes, position from a GPS sig signal, and feed that into the, the transfer functions in our processing model module. Um, and so we get two outputs from the processing. One is the mooring line tensions. And we take those tensions and get the cycles from it and do an SN curve calculation for fatigue. Uh, and we can also feed that into the peridynamic analysis. And that, that's the work done by the University of, of Strathclyde. Uh, the other output from the processing module is all these sort of 10 minute statistics. And we're able to do our kind of anomaly detection based on that sort of statistical data that, that flows out. Um, this system we envisage would operate in real time. It's continuously operating from the installation of the floater through to uh, when it's decommissioned at the end of life. Uh, so 20, 20 plus years later, um, we're aiming for 10 minute updates on the statistics and fatigue and the sort of total data collection budget um, would be about 16 megabytes per day per floating turbine. You know, and that's data that we would probably need to transfer from the floating turbine uh, through the fiber optic connection in the in the export cable on to, to, to get on shore so that the data can be analyzed and the data can be reviewed to, to check that everything is working as expected. Um, that data transfer onshore is not strictly necessary. It would be possible to do some of this offshore um, if if data transfer was a problem. 
Uh, so in conclusion, uh, remote monitoring of a floating wind turbine combined with digital twin methods, you know, the simulation models, uh, can eliminate or reduce subsea inspections um, of the, the mooring line system. Uh, and that would, would yield a significant cost saving um, and a significant health and safety reduction for exposure to of personnel and, and ships that would you know need to go out and inspect these mooring lines. Um, the features of our kind of method is we want to use robust and reliable instrumentation, nothing subsea. Um, this is a, an enabler for risk-based inspection. So what inspection you do feel necessary is targeted at the areas of the mooring system that are highest risk. Um, and that's in contrast with the sort of typical inspection uh, methodology that's, that seems to be in place, and that's inspect everything once every five years. So that's a typical what we've done on, on moored systems at the moment. And we also get this, this anomaly detection as a benefit, being able to sort of continuously measure and detect things that would become a concern. You know, our vision, you know, to take this forward, we are seeking opportunities to progress this. Uh, we're looking at commercial, uh, pre-commercial floating wind farms to sort of trial this um, for real using you know, the monitoring system that uh, we feel is necessary to, to enable this. Uh, and that concludes the, the presentation on fatigue monitoring uh, of floating wind turbines uh, of the mooring system. Uh, and so I, I, I guess I hand back to Alice um, and I think there might be some questions. Thank you very much, Stuart. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, and we've got a few questions that have come in on Slido. So just a reminder to everyone watching that to, to log on to Slido um, and use the um, webinar code of hashtag turbine to, to access those questions that have been asked already and you can vote on them, but also to, to ask any more questions that you might have. Um, I find this a really interesting topic. My kind of own exposure to anything similar would be through looking at shore tension units used in ports. So it's really nice to see this kind of application to offshore renewables. And, um, and I guess it'd be really interesting to see how um, it works in the array format. So just to kind of kick off, what, what do you think the next steps would be, Stuart, to, to operationalize this? What, what else are you looking for? Uh, to make it operational, what, you know, the instrumentation is pretty much done. Um, you know, these are, you know, proven uh, sensor packages, you know, accelerometer gyroscopes, GPS. Um, so what the challenge is to, to install that kind of monitoring system and to collect the data, large quantities of data over months, over a, you know, a year would be good. Um, and to collect that data and to, to be able to compare that with the, the sort of simulation model um, of that floating unit where we've got all the details of that floating, um, you know, all the sort of tolerances, all this, how all the sort of systems work. Um, so it really is the next step is that deployment of the system as a sort of prototype. And, you know, we are targeting the sort of pre-commercial um, projects. And, and there are a few that are going ahead within the next one to two years. Great. And, and it was interesting to see um, looking, you know, the modelling of the, the fatigue uh, in the system. Um, and... Martin Lewis has asked a really interesting question, um, which actually links into some similar experiences I've had where, so for example, in, in Wales, uh, the mussel industry is really important and they're looking at growing mussels on ropes. And that is something they're looking at doing. We also have a lot of offshore wind. So there's likely to be a fair amount of biofouling on, um, on any kind of ropes that are being put out into, into the ocean. So, so, so Martin's asked this question, um, 
what degree of excess weight of soft or hard marine uh, on the structure or chain has been modelled for, um, okay. for the potential for stress or drag on the mooring? Okay. Um, the We didn't include any marine growth in any of the simulations. Um, and we, you know, we recognise that uh, is something that can and should be done in the future. Um, but in this project, it's not something that we've considered. Um, what we did find was that uh, obviously marine growth has no impact on the sort of strength of the mooring line. It, it affects the drag from any sort of wave loading or, or you know, orbital current loading. Um, and that, that wave loading on the actual mooring system was not the dominant uh, driver. It's, it's actually the, the floater itself, which is obviously, you know, like eight or 10 meters in diameter um, compared to the, the sort of mooring chains that are, are used on Highway in Scotland. So I suspect that um, marine growth on the mooring lines is unlikely to radically change the response. I mean, there will be an effect, um, but but we 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 haven't we haven't you know proved how big or small it is. But I suspect it's small. Thank you very much. Um, uh, a few more questions coming in. Um, uh, someone said, you don't mention current speed and direction. Is the impact of current on morning line tension considered? Um, for we've, we focused on tension cycles um, rather than uh, the sort of changes in tension that would occur over time due to the current. Um, so currents wouldn't impose any dynamic tension cycles onto the mooring line tension. Um, you know, they, they're, they'd be essentially static um, tensions over much longer time series. Uh, so we've not really included current in, in this so far. Um, and obviously current would, would be another influence in things like the sort of anomaly detection and, and how, where, where the floating hull is positioned in respect to its sort of centre position. Um, so we've not really included current in, in the consideration of fatigue. The dominant fatigue is, is at the wave period um, and that's, that's the sort of dynamic response. Um, I'd say it was probably about two thirds at the wave and one third at some of the sort of hydrodynamic modes, you know, the, the heave and pitch and roll of the, the floater. Yes, and I guess as well, when it comes to looking at the um, the area in which you expect the floater to kind of move and to kind of gate that mm -hmm. in, it's something that would be very easy to correct for uh, in the same way that you're correcting for its movement through, yep. through waves. Yeah. Um. Um, I think back when you were looking at I think it was about slide eight or nine. We had a question come in saying the transfer function works well within two meters and six meters. Do the wave heights in this range contribute to the greatest fatigue damage or is this driven by the larger wave heights? The, I, I think inevitably, you know the, the 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 larger storms will produce the larger tension cycles, um, but they are they are also less common. Um, so it really depends where geographically in the world you are, um, what the sort of distribution uh, for fatigue is. Um, I think we have to monitor continuously, so that we we capture. You know we are measuring when there is a large storm. Uh, but also by monitoring continuously, we're capturing all the fatigue that happens day in, day out from what would be relatively benign uh, wave conditions. Um, but, but if we do the simulation and we, we capture that range, 
um, you know, of three meters all the way up to 12. Um, then, you know, and, and I mean, if you look at this graph, it, it shows that uh, the, you know, we've picked the, the transfer function for six meter waves and, and, and played in all the, the simulation results from all the other C states all the way up to 12. And you can see that at 12, the, you know, if you put in the motions at, that would occur in a 12 meter C state, then the fatigue is, is not well matched. You know, we've, we're at, you know, it's about point, point 0.3 or something. So it's either, you know, a third of the fatigue or three times the fatigue. So that's why we've, we've had to say, well, we need to do a simulation at 12 and get the transfer function at, in a 12 meter C state in order to have that as a valid um, prediction, a valid calculation when these sort of large storms occur. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, ah, we've got a question here from, from Martin Murphy. He says, um, an excellent presentation, Stuart, thank you. Is your process adaptable to semi-submersible platforms? And then follows on with, can it be scaled up to turbines of 15 to 20 megawatt capacity? Uh, we, there's no reason. There, there's nothing in the, the, the methodology here that excludes or somehow limits it just, just to the high wind spar. Um, I, I guess by the semi-sub, uh, you know, one of, one of the sort of concepts that's made, probably made the biggest advance would be the wind float, which is the sort of three-legged semi-sub. Um, you know, we've not done it. We'd love to do it um, and, and do the simulation modeling on that. Um, th there's, there's nothing in, in, in the simulation that would prevent us doing simulations of, of semi-subs, of doing bigger structures that were maybe up to 12, 15 megawatts. Um, there, there, there's really no limitation that we see. Um, so we, we think this is applicable to, to all the different kinds of you know, floating wind, whether it's a spar, whether it's a semi-sub, whether it's uh, one, of, one of the other tension leg, um, we see it being equally applicable. And if we can simulate it, um, which I think we can, then you know, we can put in the monitoring system uh, and be able to replicate the sort of tension cycles in the various bits of the, the mooring system. Uh, you know, different designs have different uh, requirements for the mooring line. Some have redundant mooring lines, some have a you know, one of them has a, a kind of ballast that hangs off the bottom. So again, there's, you know, that's really sort of part of the mooring system, you know, or, or sort of could be included in this kind of analysis as well. I don't, I don't see any reason why not. Great. It just sounds like you need to get them out on some, yep. some turbines in the water and get some data and, and there's no limitations. Um, moving on to some more of the fatigue questions, bearing in mind we've only got a minute left. Um, Richard Catamaran has asked uh, whether you're able to assess fatigue in the chain link components. Uh, it's not something that we did explicitly. Um, but obviously, we, you know, we, we directly, from this simulation, the output is the tension in the, the chain section of the mooring line. Uh, so having the, the sort of overall tension cycles in that chain section, um, you know, it, it really is just a case of creating a model of that chain link or, or two or three chain links um, and applying the fatigue to that, finding what the stress concentration factors are and, and how the overall tension uh, gives you stress at sort of hot spots in that chain. Like we didn't do that modeling, but uh, no reason why we, we can't. And you know, it, you know, that would be something that should be done. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you very much. There's still some questions coming in, but um, I think we're gonna have to leave it there as it's now 
one minute past the hour. So thank you very much, Stuart, for your presentation and the QA. It's a pleasure. Um, <laughs> and um, we're going to send all the questions that we've received to Stuart. So, um, so thank you very much. Thank you.